Our scripture reading this morning is from Galatians chapter 6, verses 2 through 5. The Apostle Paul says, Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they're not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they, will ta- then they can take pride in themselves alone <clears throat> without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Um, I wonder if I can turn this off. See if that helps. Does that help? I don't know if that helps or not. There's, some, there's something that happened with the mics about halfway through a song earlier, and I don't know what it is. But anyhow, we, we turned that one on pause. Um, it's good to see you this morning. Glad you could be here. Um, the Bible says that God is colorblind and tone deaf. We're to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. We're not here to put on a show for each other. We're not here to perform for each other. We're all on the stage and we're all performing for God. And so, um, brother, we're with you. You know, that's just the way that it is. And, uh, Sometimes I'll say the word Peter when I mean the word Paul, and I'll say Paul when I need Peter, and sometimes somebody will laugh and they'll say, "Eh, preacher, you got that wrong. Sometimes people will kindly come to me afterwards at church and say, you know, I don't think you said that the right way, and sometimes they're right, I didn't say it the right way, and that's just the way that it is, and that's kind of, um, that's kind of the point, Ray, where's my pointer? There we go. There we go. Uh, yeah, good. Thanks. You know, we're all in this together, man. Uh, that's, we're talking about this idea of the one another way, and this will be our last week to talk about these things. And somebody says, well, what's the point of all this? The point of all this, you know, Jesus said that, that, uh, it's the most, that there were two important laws, or two most important laws of the law, the love of God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, the great Shema of the, the Israelites. And he said the second one was likened to it, love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and prophets. If we were to hang all of these one another verses, in other words, how we treat each other, um, we could say it with two words. You ready? This is really, this is really, really deep here. Be nice. If we can go eat lunch now, Gary, where are you? We can go eat lunch now. You know, uh, must be nice. What is it, brother? Oh, okay. You know, technology is great when it works, right? I'm glad these guys help 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 take care of us. So we're going to look this morning at the at, at the, the first one another way that we're going to talk about. It's from Galatians chapter six, and we, what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to bear one another's burdens. We're supposed to bear one another's burdens. Does that work? Ah, uh, see, it's not changing anything. Yeah. Uh-huh. 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 See, it wasn't just me. Is this working? No, nope, this isn't. So, Ray, you're going to, or somebody's going to sit back there and move slides for me. So go on to the next slide. Um, we're supposed to bear one another's burdens. Now, let's talk about that for just a little bit from the verse itself. Next slide. Uh, You have to give me the next slide. There we go. This is one of those passages that people who want to uh, talk badly about your Bible or tell you you shouldn't have any faith in God or in His Word, if they know enough about the Bible, this is one of the places they'll turn. And the reason is because the difference between verse 2 and verse 5. And I, I underlined... Uh, actually, uh, actually, it's verse 2 and verse 4. The answer is in verse 5. And I underline this for you so you can see it. Paul tells us that we're to carry each other's burdens, and in this way you'll fulfill the law of Christ. Then in verse 4 he says, each one should test their own actions, or they should share your own loads, some, some translations say. Um, well, which is it, Paul? Do we, do we carry our own burden, or do we carry each other's burden? And the problem for many of us is we come, we come from dysfunctional families and from dysfunctional jobs and dysfunctional neighborhoods and dysfunctional countries, and we sometimes look at these kinds of things and we filter it through our dysfunction and we say, well, 
that feels comfortable to me when the that that feels comfortable is a dysfunction. Um, when the Bible tells us, for example, that God is our father, if you had an abusive father, you don't, you don't filter the word father the way that it's meant or the way that most people in the world do. You filter it through the abusive father that you had. And so you tend to think, well, God's an abusive father, and he treats me like an abusive father, and you get a warped view of, of God. Sometimes carrying each other's burdens is the same kind of way. Uh, in dysfunctional families, people tend to swing the pendulum back and forth between being more in your business than they should to being not enough in your business. And it swings back and forth in dysfunctional families. It's part of the dysfunction. And, uh, and so in the church, sometimes we bring that mindset, we bring that filter in the church. And so for some people, they look at the idea of sharing each other's burdens. And what they hear is, oh, great, I can sit down and everybody else will just take care of me. It's not reality. It's not even what God is asking people to do. But it's the filter that comes through their head. Other people will look at that and they'll say, oh, well, that means that nobody's going to help me with my problems. It's always on me to help somebody else. See, that's a different kind of a dysfunctional filter. Like most biblical truth, the truth is somewhere balanced in between the two. And we see that, uh, we, we, we see that in the, this verse, we're to carry each other's burdens in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Um, Verse 5 says we're to carry our own load. Well, which is it? Yes. Yes. See, there's a, there, there, there's a verse that says we're to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. The point is that Paul's making here is that in this area, this business of carrying each other's loads, the determining factor ought to be each one testing their own actions. So, for example, you have something go wrong in your family. You have something, some problem in your life. You get sick or somebody dies. And because of this verse, and maybe you come from a slightly dysfunctional background, and you cross your arms and say, well, that church doesn't really love me because they didn't feed me like I wanted them to feed me and they didn't do like I wanted them to do me and they didn't call me like I want. Those elders don't care about me because they didn't call me as often as I want them to call me. The problem is those are the same people that if you call them too much, they say they're getting in my business and trying to boss me around. I don't want them in my business so much. The problem is taking these verses and trying to judge other people. When the purpose of these verses is not to judge other people, not to judge how they're treating me, the question is, how do I treat other people? We get it backwards. Why? Because we come from dysfunctional backgrounds. If it functioned properly, we'd understand, oh yeah, well, of course that makes sense. Of course, of course the only thing I can do is to change me. Well, of course, the only thing I can do is handle me and my business and how I treat other people. I can't run your life. I can't run your show. But I want to. Right? We're supposed to bear one another's burdens. But the test is not how much do other people bear your burdens. The test is how much do you bear others. That's what this is talking about. Now, if it's functioning properly, if the family of God functions in a functional, healthy way, what happens is everybody helps with everybody's problems and everybody gets their problems helped with. But guess what happens? The blueprint of the church is perfect. The guidelines are perfect. But guess where the problem comes in? Me. Me. You take human beings and you introduce them into the perfect equation, the perfect blueprint, and guess what we do? We do what we always do. We mess it up. We don't think about it correctly. We don't look about it correctly. We filter everything through our past experiences and what we think is right. And so if you ever get to a point where everybody in the church does and thinks what they think is right, you find, a, you find that the church becomes like the culture of the judges in the Old Testament. And if you haven't read the stories of the judges lately, if you've got a grandson or a son, I suggest you dust off your Bible sometime that with your grandson or son that you read the stories from Joshua and Judges. I call them the Conan the Barbarian stories. 
And if you read those stories with a middle school boy or a grade school boy, they're going to go, ooh, that's so cool. And grandma's going to say, don't read that. I don't want to hear about the woman that took a tent peg and drove it through, drove it through a guy's temple and hammered his, his brains into the ground. Ooh, that's so cool. That's so terrible. Ooh, that's gross. Read me another one. Right? We don't want to, uh, you know, Grandma doesn't want to hear about Ehud who, who snuck his way into the king's bedroom. And he pulls out a knife from underneath his shift and he says, I've got a message for you, king. And he takes that knife and he buries it into his belly. And the Bible says the king was so fat that the fat lapped out over the guy's, the handle of the guy's knife. And he snuck out and he told me, he locked the door and he said, he's in the bathroom, he'll be a while. Oh, that's so cool. Look, what led to those kind of horrific things was the very beginning of the book that says, and everybody did what was right in their own eyes. You ever wonder why people do what they do? Because they think it's right. How could somebody think something that stupid is right? Hello, we're all dysfunctional. We're all a little bit crazy. We're all a little bit off a bubble. You know, it's like it, we're, we're, none of us are what we ought to be. None of us think the way we should be. None of us act the way we ought to act. We're all a little weird. Some of us are more weird than others. And I say us because I'm kind of that way too. This is one of those situations where our weirdness and our oddness can turn a Bible verse on its head. The point is not how people treat me. The point is how I treat others. How I treat others. And so the point is we're supposed to bear one another's burden. Let's try this again. Hey, it worked that time. I don't believe it. Next thing uh, in our list is we're supposed to encourage one another and build each other up. Let's go back to this one just a minute. Um, we're to encourage and build each other up. Now... Different people do this in different kinds of ways, and different families do this in different kinds of ways. Uh, I don't think I've told you this story. When I, when I first left home to go to college, my father uh, had been a sergeant in the Air Force. He dropped out of school in the seventh grade. He didn't learn to speak English until he left home. Um, I can remember times that uh, as a little boy, he would come home, and he would still have his his uh, Air Force uniform on, and I would find him sitting on the floor in the hallway reading the encyclopedia. So I think that's where I started my, my love for reading, my love for knowledge was watching my father value it so badly. Anyway, I can still remember at the age of 17, I had everything that I owned loaded, uh, loaded into a, a, uh, a Pinto. You guys remember Pintos? This was a baby blue Pinto. It had been used as a pickup and delivery car around town. You couldn't look six inches in any direction without seeing a scuff for a dent. The headlights were cocked. Uh, the back tires were oversized snow tires because they were the cheap ones we could find. And when you went across uh, railroad tracks, the back end would bounce around sideways and you'd have to kind of correct for that, right? Everything I owned was in this Pinto. And I'm starting to, to, to go off to school and as I put the car in reverse, my father walks out on the driveway and with tears in his eyes, <laughs> this was his attempt to encourage and build me up. You ready? It's an example of how our dysfunctions can come from our families. And with tears in his eye and with a sob in kind of his voice, he says, if you become an educated egghead, I'll kill you myself. And he patted my arm and walked back inside the house. Now, if you come from a less than perfect family, if you've got less than perfect family members in your family, you hear a story like that and you laugh because instead of seeing my father, you see a face from your family and from your background. That's the way we live, right? Now, I knew my father and I knew that he loved me and I saw the tear in his eye and I heard the sob in his voice. If you pulled the words out and just put them in an email or stuck them on a page somewhere and stuck them on the wall, you become an educated, egg, educated egghead, I'll kill you myself. It becomes a threat. But he wasn't threatening me. He wasn't threatening me. I learned after I left home to hug my father and tell him I love him. I didn't learn that from him. You know why? Because the generation he came from and the culture that he came from, manly men don't do that. You show your love some other way. You don't say the words. You, show, you prove it by your works. 
And if they can't learn it from your works, there's something wrong with you. You're not working to show it hard enough. You shouldn't have to say the words. I think that's a bunch of baloney now. I tell my kids and grandkids that I love them. I tell my wife that I love her. But that wasn't how I was raised. See, we need to learn how to encourage and build one another up. And so that means two things. Number one, it means we've got to learn to say new words and in new ways that we weren't raised being comfortable with. And number two, we've got to learn to hear what people mean past their clumsy words. Sometimes people's words are just clumsy and they mean well and they love you and they, they want to encourage you, but their words just don't do it and we get angry. Well, why didn't they say it this way? I don't know. Why didn't you say it differently the last time you made somebody mad when you were trying to say something good? Somebody says, well, preacher, why, why, is, why is all this important? It's important because that's the way God wants us to be. We're supposed to encourage and build each other up. And so this is how he says it to the Thessalonians. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, if you're receiving wrath or if you're giving wrath, you're not part of God's plan. If you're angry and if you're frustrated and your words are harsh or you're expecting and you're hearing harsh words and you take them harshly, God says, no, that's not what I'm about. I'm not about you to suffer wrath. I'm not about you showing wrath. I'm not about you displaying your anger or receiving anybody else's anger. God says, that's not what I'm about. But to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, he died for us so that whether we're awake or asleep, we may live together with him. It doesn't matter whether you're dead, whether you're alive. This world is not all that there is. And the correlate from that is there's lots of things worse than dying. And if you don't believe that, just go spend a little time in hospitals somewhere. And you'll find people who are experiencing things that are worse than dying. Now, that's true if you're a Christian. If, there's not, if you're not a Christian, then dying is about as bad as it gets because the game's over. Time's up. Oops. But for God's people, death is not all that there is. This life is not all that there is. There's a Christian song that's been out for a long time that says, uh, and a friend's a friend forever if the Lord's the Lord of them. And a friend will not say never because the welcome never ends. Listen, Jesus says that on the other side, after death, you will recognize people you knew in this life. The rich man and Lazarus recognized each other. Now, how'd they do that when the body was laying in the ground somewhere? I don't know. But the you that's you is going to live forever somewhere. And the you that's you, as I say in Texas, y'all, the y'all that's y'all is going to live forever somewhere. And so we're supposed to encourage each other with these words. Now, it's not encouraging if y'all don't like y'all. Do you understand what I'm saying? If we haven't learned how to communicate with each other and how to say things in ways that get past our past and get past our clumsy words, if we haven't learned how to hear what people mean, and if we haven't learned how to say things in better ways, eternity could sound like hell to you if you're going to be with these people forever. I'm convinced that's one of the problems that we have with young people today. the way we describe heaven and the way we think of heaven and what they see in our churches sounds like hell to them. And they're not sure they want to be a part of that forever. They kind of like being out and away from that. And that's kind of our fault. As the older people, we're supposed to be wiser. We're supposed to be the ones who, who have the ability. We're the ones that have the experience. It's on us to learn to speak better. It's not on the kids to learn to speak our speak. And it's on us to hear better. We need to hear the heart of our grandchildren past the clumsy words that don't say it the way you want it said. And we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be so proud and pompous that when our grandkids say something away, we don't want it said. We should learn to hear their hearts, not their words. And we need to learn to do that for each other as well. Why? Because we're all going to be together forever. We ought to figure this out. That's what this is for. Well, why should I be a part of that church? They don't do what I want to do, and they don't say what I want to say. That's why you need to be a part of that church. 
You need to get used to it. You need to learn how to live with it. You need to learn how to navigate it. Well, that's not what I want. Well, maybe you don't want heaven then. <gasps> Preacher, how can you talk to me like that? I'm just trying to tell you what Paul's saying here. There's supposed to be an encouragement that comes from reminding each other that whether we're awake or whether we're asleep, we're in Christ and we're, gonna, we're in this stew together. Whether the song's led right, whether the mic works right, whether, the, whether the, the clicker works right, whether the preacher gets the right words, whether somebody uh, says something that makes you angry or doesn't do what you want them to do. Listen, we're in this together. Wouldn't it be great if our country could figure that out? We're in this together. We rise or we fall together. Jesus said a nation that's divided against itself cannot stand. That's why it was so foolish for people to accuse him of using the power of Satan to cast out Satan. God says, that's ridiculous. A divided kingdom can't stand. A divided church can't stand. A divided family can't stand. And as we learned from James this morning, a double-minded person that's divided in their head can't stand. And here's the place to work it out. With these folks, we get to practice with each other. This is... This is, this is in some senses, what you're living is the real thing. It's not a dress rehearsal. But if you think about the next life, this kind of is a dress rehearsal. You know, it's, it, we're, we're practicing now for eternity and what all that means, we don't really know for sure. But now's the practice. And we're supposed to encourage each other with these things. How about the next one? Um, we're supposed to stimulate each other to love and good needs. Now, I have to be honest with you. It's easier for me to stimulate you to frustration than it is for me to stimulate you to, to good deeds. <laughs> Ray and I were talking in the back, and he was asking, did, did uh, Lee give me the microphone? And I said, yeah. He says, yeah, I'm going to get all these monkeys, monkeys trained. And about that time, Marilyn walked through, and I said, get, speaking of getting monkeys trained, <laughs> and she looked at me. She gave me the look. Every man knows the look, whether it's from mama or sister or his wife or from a gang god or somewhere. She gave me the look. That was pretty easy. You know, it was pretty easy for me to irritate her just a little bit, to, you know, poke, poke, poke at her. I, I, I find that very easily. What's tough for me is to find ways to do that same thing, but to get people to do good things. I can get people irritated and say, Angry things, that's pretty easy. In fact, I can carry that way, way, way too far, and I usually did when I was young. I had to learn uh, a little better. But let's look back at Hebrews chapter 10. We, we, we looked at that as a, as a church through the book of Hebrews not too long ago. The writer of Hebrews says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we possess. For he who, is pro who promised is faithful, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards... Harsh words and arguments? Are we supposed to seek how we can spur one another to agree with me so I get what I want? No, that's not what he says. Spur one another on to love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. Somebody says, why do I need to come to church? Why, why, does, why does anybody need to come to this church? We... we we, we, we simulcast our services. On Wednesday nights, I set up a, a tripod down here, and I'll do a, a, a Facebook Live post, and Ray posts something to our website. And So why should, you, why should you come to church on Wednesday night? Why should you come to church on Sunday? I mean, I can just, why do I need to do that? Because you're not going to be prompted and pushed to do good things just by the stuff that the preacher says. It's something that we do for one another. If you're counting on the preacher to teach you everything you need to learn, if you're counting on the preacher to point you in every direction you need to go, if you're counting on the preacher to make sure you're living your life right, guess what? I got news for you. You're in trouble. I can't even run my own life like I should. What you need is the same thing I need. I'm such a mess my life is such a disaster. My thoughts and my words are such oatmeal that I need other people around me to say, you know, that was good. 
Or, you know, that wasn't so good. Or just to say, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, man. I'm in, the, I'm in the same situation you're in. See, when you, you, can, you can get knowledge from reading a book. You can get knowledge from a video cast. What you can't get is you can't get the feel. I was on the, a, a, a webcast last night for a friend of mine in Pennsylvania. He turned 70, and his son did a, uh, did a uh, webcast where everybody could uh, log in, and he surprised his dad. He put him down in front of the computer, and up popped like 13 or 15 friends from all over the country. And uh, one of the things that Jim said was, he said, uh, said, Rick, I don't know if I'd be talking to you or not. Did you see what the Huskers did to Penn State this week? And I had to tell him, no, I didn't know. <laughs> I missed that broadcast. But you see, in his family, you don't watch a broadcast by yourself, whether it's the Philadelphia Eagles playing on Sunday or Penn State on Saturday. What you do in his family and in his neighborhood are, you either go to somebody's garage and hang out and watch it on a TV screen in the garage with all the guys hooping and hollering and making noise for the neighborhood to hear, or... If it's too cold to do that, you all go to somebody's house and you all bring something to eat and you all, see this sounds familiar, right? You all bring something to eat, you all bring something to drink, you make sure the TV's turned up really loud so that you can scream and holler and throw popcorn at the TV screen. And the gold standard for being a Penn State diehard fan is to load up the pickup or the camper and you go to campus early that morning or the night before, and you set up out on the parking lot for tailgating. And people bring out their grills, and you grill something, and your neighbor grills something, and they share a little of theirs with you, and you share a little of yours with them. And when it comes time for the game, everybody whoosh, makes the big, big, uh, big walk into the, And somebody in your group chooses to not go in the stand. They'll sit and they'll watch it on TV or listen to it on the radio so they can watch all the stuff and they can cook the ribs so that when everybody comes back out, whoosh, you got ribs to eat and ribs to share. And some of those people stay there until there's absolutely no cars on the road before they get out on the road. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a point of pride that they didn't just go to the game, but they got the experience with other die-hard Penn State fans. Does that sound familiar to you? I was showing Ron my, my, my new garage. I said, you know, there's something about this garage I don't understand. He said, what's that? I said, there's a, there's, a, a, there's a projection screen that you can pull down in my garage. And he starts laughing. He said, I can tell you what happens. He said, the people who used to own this place probably turned on the TV and their wives ran them out in the garage because they made too much noise. Hello. Why don't we think about the church that way? Why don't we think about gathering with each other in that way? Because we don't think about it that way. See, the gathering for the church is not so much about what you get, because let's face it, they got instant replays and better camera angles on TV. It's very close to the restroom, and you can get a snack in the kitchen, and if you've got a DVR, you can actually record it and replay it yourself at a later time and get rid of the commercials. Why would you go live? Who in the right mind would want to go see a, a Huskers game? Wouldn't you like to go see a Husker game now after, after a year of quarantine? Wouldn't you like to do that? How about the next one, another thing? We're supposed to pray for each other. We're supposed to pray for each other. Therefore, confess your sins to each other. Lee talked about this in class this morning where he said, you know, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be really good if I, could, if I could tell you my weaknesses so you could help me with them? And I'm sure there's people who hear that with a sense of just utter terror. Because we come from dysfunctional families and dysfunctional jobs and dysfunctional neighborhoods and dysfunctional friendships where if 
something, if, if there's a fault in us, it gets picked on until we cry. And people say, gotcha. I grew up with teeth that are incredibly healthy. Can you see my teeth? They're really healthy, Rob. Dennis hate to see me come. It's like, yeah, okay, we cleaned your teeth again. See you, see you in six months, see you in 12 months. But there's a problem with my teeth. They're crooked. And one of the reasons they're crooked is because I still have all four of my wisdom teeth, Gary. <laughs> we were talking about this the other day, right? I still have all four of my wisdom teeth, and there's not room in my head for all four of my wisdom teeth, but they never did really hurt. They never did really get impacted. And so as a kid, I never had my wisdom teeth taken out. And so I just have crooked teeth. You know what the kids called me when I was in middle school? See my, see my little cuspids here? Count Dracula. Ooh, don't bite my neck with those crooked teeth. Today you can tell me that, I'll say, yeah, whatever, I don't even care. But as a kid, there's a sense in which that kind of got under my skin and kind of scarred me in a way that down today, it's like I have to constantly remind myself, yeah, I got crooked teeth, but they're healthy. You know, I haven't paid a dentist much. I'm not wearing dentures and uh, they still work pretty good. It's kind of bad for biting a sandwich, but, or a piece of pizza, but they still work pretty good. Now, as preacher, as preacher, what does that have to do with us confessing our faults to one another? Well, see, we all have things in our hearts and our minds and our lives that we know are broken. There's things about each of us that we know we're not right. We know something, whatever that something is, is broken about us, and we all have it. There's nobody, somebody, oh, you know, I wish I had a perfect life that, like that preacher. No, you don't want the preacher's life, trust me. I, I, wish, I wish I could have a, uh, you know, I wish I could have a, 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 a perfect life like, like, well, just pick somebody. I go to church and they all smile. How are you doing? Fine. Their kids behave. My kids don't behave. And they come to church and they, they don't have any problems on the way to church. They don't have to scold their kids. Don't make me stop this car. We're going to church now. You guys behave. Why is my family like this? Your family is like that because every family is like that. Your marriage is like it is because every marriage is like that. Oh, I wish I, wish I could have the perfect husband like Tammy. That's the sound she would make if she heard you say that. I, 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 I wish I could have... I wish I had the perfect wife like Rick. <laughs> I got friends who are big manly men who know my wife and they say, your wife scares me. You say, well, she doesn't scare me. Well, you just don't know her like those guys do. <laughs> oh, but, but, but Rick, you always treat your wife well. No, I really don't. You're just, by saying that, you know, you, you're proving that you don't really know me very well. You don't know me very well. But see, here's the point. If, as long as I'm the one telling you that, I'm the one in control of it. But if I don't tell you that, and it becomes obvious to you because, hello, I'm a mess, and now you start telling me what I haven't told you, or you start telling others what I haven't publicly said, and now guess what? It gets back to me, and I'm discouraged because, oh, they, they think badly about me. We're not going to look at it this morning, but Psalm 73 is one of those psalms where the guy who's a fellow by the name of Asaph was a worship leader at the temple, and he said, he said, my, my faith was weak, my feet foot almost slipped. Uh, he said, I was worried about bad things happen to good and good things happen to bad, but I couldn't tell people because I didn't want them, through my lack of faith, to have a lack of faith in God. And so he talks about this whole mental process of hiding people himself off and keeping people at arm's length so that he could go to church and lead in worship and nobody knows that he's really struggling and, and hurting inside. That's what the whole psalm is about. And if you've ever felt those feelings, you should read Psalm 73, and it's in two pieces. The first half is all his doubts, all his fears, all his worries. 
There's a pivot verse that said, then I went to the house of God. And the second half of the psalm is all about how it resolved in his head this problem that he was having. And the pivot point was he quit worrying about his own head and he went and joined the people of God. And he didn't just go in presence. He did what this verse of James is telling us. At some point he confessed it. And somebody else said, well, yeah, I feel that way sometimes too. Really? You mean there's two of us? No. No. So how do you help somebody that isn't telling you what their weaknesses are? Because everybody you know here today has a weakness. Every one of us has a need. Every one of us has something in our life that we really wish people could pray about us for and with. And yet, if we haven't told them and they don't know what it is, what do you do? You pray anyway. You pray anyway. You say, but, 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 but Rick, I don't... I, I, so-and-so is such a strong person today. They don't have any health problems. They don't have any problems with their kids. Why do they need my prayers? I don't know, but I know they need them. Well, preacher, how do you know that? Because we're all in the soup together. And sometimes we're leading the song and get it right, and sometimes we don't. But it didn't change who we are. It didn't change whose we are. What should we do? We should pray for each other. When? Whenever. Do you only pray for people that ask for prayers? Oh, I can't pray for somebody unless they ask me to pray for them. No. (laughs) They don't have that control over you. You can pray for who you wish to pray for whenever you wish to pray for them. You can pray for them in the shower. You can pray for them driving down the road. You can pray for them before a meal. You can pray for them before you go to sleep at night. You can pray for them when you wake up in the morning, and they don't even know. But if you believe in the God Most High, God knows what the problem in their life is, and God can help them and will help them because sometimes you ask Him to. Here's the last one for this morning. The Bible tells us that we're to be hospitable to one another. Here's the verse, 1 Peter 4, 8. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. You know why it's okay for your grandkids to have a cold and sneeze on you and get snot on your shirt? Because you love them deeply and it covers a multitude of sins. Do you know why your best friend can tell you something and you'll think about it and somebody else will tell you and you want to fight and punch them? Because love covers a multitude of sins. Why are we supposed to love each other deeply? Why are we supposed to show that and say it and act on it? Because guess what? At some point along the line, you're going to do or say something that makes them angry and you're going to need their love (laughs) to get past your stupidity. Maybe I should say our stupidity, right? Verse 9, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Listen, you need to know if you, if you haven't, if somebody ever, ever has told you this, that there is a difference between hospitality and entertainment. Many people think, when they think hospitality, they think, oh, I got to get my house clean. I got to get a perfect meal. I got to make sure there's no laundry on the couch. The, va- the floor has been vacuumed. There's no fingerprints or nose prints if you've got pets and kids on the black glass. I got to get everything just right before I ask somebody to come to my house. And I'm telling you, that's okay, but that's not hospitality, that's entertainment. You know what I say? You want to be entertained, turn on your TV. Tammy's got a plaque that hangs in our kitchen. Some of you have seen it. It says, if you come to see me, come anytime. If you come to see my house, make an appointment. That's the difference between entertainment and hospitality. We're not called to entertain each other. We're called to show hospitality. Say, okay, smart preacher man, what does that mean then? Here's what hospitality means. Hospitality means inviting people in to share the life that you're already living. And some of us get wide-eyed and say, oh, that's scary. 
And it is scary because we come from dysfunctional families who are used to taking our weaknesses and our failures and using them against us. None of that's hospitality. Hospitality is, come on over. Uh, Tammy used to tell people years ago when she was raising kids, she'd say, uh, you know, you can sign your name in the dust on our tables, just don't put a date. <laughs> and somebody says, why not? She said, because then you'll know how long it's been since that was written there, and I haven't dusted my, my, my furniture. Yes, we need to be people with, who are hospitable, but what hospitability means is we share who we are and how we live. If there's laundry on the couch, scoot it over or fold it. That's hospitality. If, you know, if, if, if you walk in and there's a smudge on the, the glass and it bugs you, well, get a rag and fix it. But it's your house. I know, isn't that great? Well, Rick, I can't have people thinking that I'm a slob. Why not? You are. No, I'm not. Okay, okay. Chill. I got to make sure my car is perfectly clean and that all the Cheerios have been vacuumed out from the grandkids before I give somebody a ride. No, you don't. Tell them to brush the Cheerios off before they sit down or sit down and take them with them, with you. Either way, it's okay. You're, it's a win. Right? Well, I, I got stuff I got to do. Great. Have people come do it with you. I need to do this, I need to do that, neither. We'll ask somebody to come over to the house and do it with you. That's hospitality. Oh, but people wouldn't think right about me. Ah, you're one of those entertainment people. Okay. Trust me, I'd rather watch TV for entertainment than come to your house. <laughs> Although it could be entertaining if your grandkids are around, right? Or your pets. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Well, how can you do it without grumbling? It's always so much work, and it's always so much, there's your problem. You're not showing hospitality. You're trying to entertain. Well, well, what if I don't have any food fixed? Have them come in and help you fix it. Here, open this can and put it. There's some pans over in the corner there, and the paper towels are there. And Does that sound familiar? Maybe from our childhoods? Back when people tended to be just more people. And you go to somebody's house, come on in. Here's a phrase people used to say you don't ever hear anymore. Ready? Come in if you can get in. You ever heard that? I bet you had heard that in 30 years. Why? Because we're more into entertainment than we are into hospitality. And since we have confused entertainment with hospitality, we say, well, I can't do that. I don't have the money. I can't buy the food. I don't have the time. I don't have the... Do it without grumbling. Just, just do it. Just do it. Verse 10, each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others. As faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. When Tammy and I were a young married couple, we lived in Montgomery, Alabama for a while. And there was a young couple that we went to church with, and they were about the same age as us, a little older. Their kids were a little older. But they had just started a pest control business, and they were as broke as we were. And we would get together on Wednesday nights for Bible study. And one Wednesday night, they said, hey, why don't you come over to the house after Bible study? And I was still thinking along the lines of entertainment, Right? But they had the idea of, they had the right idea of hospitality. So we get to their house and there's toys all over the, the yard that you can't hardly even get in the driveway because of the pedal cars for the kids. And we walk up the front porch and the guy says, come in if you can get in. And we walk into the house and it's not a, uh, it's not a shack and it's not a dump. But it's not ready for architectural digest just to take pictures either. You know, there's the clothes on the couch were clean, but they needed to be folded. And the basket was still sitting there. And you go into their kitchen and, you know, the trash can wasn't overflowing onto the floor. And there weren't roaches everywhere because he was a pest control guy, right? But the can was kind of half full. And we sit down at the table and I'm thinking, 
it's after Bible class. We've already had dinner. What are, what are, what are we going to do? What are we gonna... And she gets out some cheddar cheese and a little bowl, and she opens a jar of mustard and takes a spoon, <clears throat> puts a spoon of mustard in the bowl, gives everybody a glass of water because she didn't have any tea made, hello, let alone so- no soft drinks. They couldn't afford soft drinks just like we couldn't. And she put the cheese slices and the mustard on the table. And like an idiot, I said, what if I don't like cheese and mustard? She said, more for me. And she sat down. That's hospitality. She didn't need to give me a big meal. She didn't need to cook me a steak. If I didn't like her cheese, it wasn't any big deal to her. She'd just eat more of the cheese herself. But I was welcome to it. I was invited to participate with it. And did you know that couple became some of our best friends through the years? I still think about our friendship with them. I still think about our friendship with them. I remember one time her husband was out of, out of, uh, out of town and she had a water faucet on the outside that broke off and it was running water. And I had a handyman company. She called me and she said, my husband's gone. The water's running. I don't know what to do. Can you come help? Why did she call me? Because I'd been in her house when the laundry was not folded. And I'd shared cheese and mustard with her at a table that still needed to be wiped off from where the kids made a mess at the dinner table. And I still remember my father at that time was with me visiting that day. And the phone call, I said, I said, I got to go. And he says, what do you mean you got to go? I'm here to visit with you. I said, yeah, but you, you can go with me. Hospitality, right? You can go with me. Well, why are you going? She's fed me cheese and mustard. I've seen the unfolded clothes on her couch. Her husband's become one of my best friends. He can't take care of her. i got to go. It wasn't one of those things where, well, i got to go so I can tell people at church what a good Christian I was last week. No. What hospitality does is it binds people together in ways that you'll never be bound otherwise. Never. I'm going to end with this story, and then the lesson will be yours. I was fortunate in high school to, to uh, be, be raised in Amarillo, Texas. And uh, on Fridays, there were church people who would bring up instructors from Sunset School of Preaching to teach Bible classes in people's living rooms. And I would go to study in their living rooms with these professors from the School of Preaching in Lubbock. And... Uh, one time I was invited to go back from there to Lubbock with them to be, for, be there for a weekend seminar. So I was, yeah, okay, I'll go. And so we're on the way back, and I'm with uh, Richard Rogers and Jim McGuigan and Richard Rogers' son. And we get halfway in the middle of nowhere, and Richard Rogers' son says, Daddy, I got to go. No entertainment here. No putting on a best face here. This guy's a professor of people who've been preachers for all over the world. And yet his son's saying, Daddy, I got to go. I got to go now. And I will never forget as a teenager how he, this exalted man of God, this instructor of thousands, pulled over on the side of a dark road, opened two doors, stood his young boy between the two doors and said, okay. And the next thing I heard, point that thing the other way, boy. I don't want it in my car. And I was stunned. I thought this guy was like the best Bible scholar I'd ever known. And his words were like, right from heaven. And many times they were. They were exactly what I needed to hear. And he taught me a lot of good things. But it was hospitality that taught me something about him. He's a guy just like me. Guess what I said a few years later when I had a son who said, Daddy, I got to go. I opened the car doors. I said, go ahead. And just like the man I admired so much said, I Point the other way, boy. I don't want that in the car. 
you'll never get those kind of things in Bible classes. You'll never get those kind of things like you will, from sharing life with each other. We become each other's mentors. We become each other's teachers. And the price is somebody has got to admit their faults and be willing to invite people into hospitality. And that's the way that it works in the kingdom of God. You say, well, I've never experienced that. Well, then you haven't experienced what God wants you to experience. And remember, the point is you're supposed to check yourself, not what other people do. Nobody's invited me to their house. Okay, have you, how many people have you invited to yours? That's the point. Well, I wish people would invite me to my other house and feed me something to do. I, I invited somebody to my house one time. In fact, I invited them twice, and they never did invite me back. You remember what Jesus said about that? Don't just invite people who can invite you in return. Invite people who can't, who won't, who haven't, who don't. Why? Because that becomes worship to God. Oh, well, that's, we only worship on Sunday morning. No. We're supposed to worship with all of our lives. And how do we do that? By treating each other well. Just be, just be nice. Just relax and be who you are. Trust people to give you the kind of grace that God has given them. And if you find those people, and you will, who don't do that, just understand they're not living as they should, and they've just admitted to you what maybe their big fault is. So I'm going to assume that we all have something about this we need to pray about. We're going to sing, sing a song. You can respond publicly if you need to. If you're not a Christian, you need to be one. I'd love to talk to you about how to do that. That wasn't my topic today, but um, we've got people that can study with you if you don't want to study with me even. But let's pray, and then we'll sing. And uh, Our Father, we thank you so much. Thank you for the church. Thank you for people who have loved us enough to be honest with us, honest with their own failures, honest with their own successes. Thank you for those who have invested in us and, and uh, shared their lives with us, who have taught us the little things in life that make all the difference in the world. And Father, we pray that you would help those of us that are now especially older. May we be those people for someone else. May we be that for each other. May we always judge ourselves and our actions by your word. And may we be more eager to judge ourselves than we are to judge others. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.